Alrighty then, here we go. Um, hi everyone, how's it going? Team here, and this is BXJS Weekly, a JavaScript news podcast, and uh, this is episode four. Hell, if we started this recently, but that already feels like a um, whole bunch of time. So, we got a bunch of pretty exciting news today, and as usual, you can find the whole list on GitHub in this um, BXJS Weekly repository under episode four um, with a date start markdown. There are some releases, some libs and demos, and some silly stuff as well. Uh, hey, Mikael, how's it going? Hey, Strax. Uh, welcome, guys. Welcome to the stream. Let us get started because, as you can see on um, this tab, we have quite a lot of uh, stuff to talk about. So, our first thing is something I was actually talking about on a previous uh, podcast. It is pattern matching proposal, and it has now been updated with the... Um, uh, exactly things that maybe cats um, discussed on Twitter. So there is now a full proposal updated to match whatever was discussed there and it looks really, really cool. So it is stage zero right now, I believe. Yes, exactly. And, um, you know, as I said, I'm really excited about that. I think that pattern matching is an incredible thing and really looking forward to seeing that um, maybe not in the I mean, obviously in JavaScript itself, but I'm really waiting for the Babel 7 to come out because there's a lot of those really cool proposals that are uh, obviously will take some time to get into the language itself, but uh, that I would absolutely use with Babel once it allows it. And uh, to do that, I will have to basically wait for Babel 7 release, which hopefully should be soon. So we're going to see how that goes. All right. So this is the first thing we got. Um, the next thing is Another, um, I don't think it's a proposal yet, but it is sort of form a forming proposal, right? So the um, it's called package name maps, and the idea is that the web currently has a very bare import specifier, right? So you can only say import something from a package name, and most of the time in in Node.js worlds, the package manager knows that this is something in the Node modules, right? But when you do that in browser, you you have no idea like the, the loader, the imports uh, doesn't really know where the hell does this comes from, right? So the idea here is to provide um, package map names, uh, it's going to be in a it's going to be living in a script tag with type package map, we can actually specify the scopes and packages for the specific things to be loaded, right? So you can actually resolve everything yourself, which sounds like a sensible thing to do. Um, obviously, there might be better solutions to this. So I, I, I never even thought about this problem, actually, to be honest. So I'm so used to using stuff like Webpack and, you know, loaders that I, I haven't even given it a single thought, essentially. So we'll be curious to see if it makes it to the official proposals to stage zero maybe and and further and will be interesting to see like how the feedback develops here but it definitely is an interesting problem to tackle and i could see more than one use for that so it's um, really cool to see that you know it's kind of getting pushed right the next thing we have is um it's not exactly a news here but i just thought i highlighted it for anyone who uses react and uh, doesn't know about the way that the facebook guys test react so if you did know the facebook uses the latest like whatever it is the the edge version of react uh, on facebook itself live with whatever the components they have which is around 50,000 components there and um, they always consider upgrade path and they always consider um, how to essentially develop react in a way that there is an easy code modable upgrade path because they have to do that for themselves first so if you ever thought why is react so stable and so nicely working? Well, here's your answer. And I think you know, this, this is this is basically worth highlighting, in my opinion, maybe you didn't know about it, but uh, now you do. So there's definitely a lot of work going into that. Right, speaking, um, right, okay, so next thing we got is the standardizing Node.js version in an NPM package. It's a neat little trick that uh, not everyone might be aware of. It's been around for quite some time. So, um, First things first, you all probably know about NVM, which is Node Version Manager, right? And you know that you can use NVM to install different Node package, Node versions on your system and use them alongside each other. But uh, not everyone has NVM installed and sometimes you need to enforce the Node version for the specific projects. Well, you can actually do that using NPM. Yeah, so you can just do NPM install Node and then tag version and uh, save exact. 
And once you run your project, it will actually use the node that is installed within the um, node packages, right? So node, node mod, uh, God, why am I saying node packages? Node modules, obviously, right? And um, this is a really cool approach to sort of um, making your project consistent and run in the same way across all the uh, developers machines because you know people tend to update their node to whatever the hell they want and I for example uh, like to have my current node running to be like the latest version which is like 10, 9, uh, 10 some, 9, 9 .10 or something right but uh, some projects and I even have my own that I prefer to run on the LTS version of nodes for the sake of consistency right and for the sake of like not everyone runs on the edge right so there's not all the features are available. This allows you to basically do that and uh, it can be dev dependency as well. So obviously, which means it won't be installed in production, which is also can be a good thing. Um, so yeah, it's it's not, you know, there's nothing fancy about it. It's just a little neat trick that might help you in your uh, project development. So let us continue. Next thing is a bit of an announcement. Uh, it's called introducing Code Sandbox Live. Um, it basically the Code Sandbox guys have added real time collaboration in the browser. So you might have or might have not heard about Code Sandbox is one of those uh, online editors playgrounds where you can just live edit uh, react JavaScript, whatever the hell you want, basically. And it's it's one of the nicer ones, right? So it's basically they have very good uh, auto suggesting and it, it feels a lot like um, VS Code essentially online. Uh, and uh, before that, they were just sort of standalone thing that you could uh, use on your own and then share the code with someone, right? So now you can actually share the code and collaborate on it together with another user, which is always great, especially if you're trying to solve some, you know, bug or a problem or um, demonstrate something and need some help from someone, right? So this is always great to see the uh, life, they even have like the classroom modes now, which is pretty cool. I think that might be used for like, you know, the workshops or something. So yeah, it's a pretty neat addition. And um, they seem to be using Elixir in the backend, which is even more interesting. So this is something I, uh, I mean, I've been like playing around with Elixir for the past year or so and just used it in mostly like toy projects. And it's a great language. It's a functional language. So uh, based on the Erlang um, or running in the Erlang VM, let's put it this way. Does I would call it modern day Erlang, which, um, you know, it brings a lot of very interesting things because the of the Erlang design. But uh, yeah, so definitely do have a look if you are in need of collaborative uh, online editors. This is one of the more modern ones, let's put it this way. And uh, it's open source, so you can actually have a look at how the hell does it works, uh, which is always great as well. All right, continuing, we got uh, effective snapshot testing from uh, Can See Dodds. Uh, you might know him from a bunch of online courses, pretty great ones, and from a bunch of libraries and um, articles. He does quite a lot of work. So this article talks about the snapshot testing. Uh, I think I covered it in a one or two videos, but uh, this basically goes more code sandbox is really great. Yes, it, it is indeed very interesting and uh, has a lot of really cool tech behind it. Coming back to snapshot testing. So uh, this article goes basically to talk about um, some feedback from the devs on Twitter who are not happy about snapshot testing and who uh, have arguments against it. But uh, basically the, the gist here is that the snapshot testing is not, does, you, you don't have to use it for everything, right? And sometimes it's not a correct thing to use, but it does shine a lot where you need to test things that are generated by the apps like logs or error messages or console output or whatever the hell you know that you would normally have to manually capture and then sort of match which is annoying and with snapshots you can just say hey match snapshot right so this is kind of great thing uh, there's also apparently the babel plugin tester thing which is it relies on snapshot heavily so i never written any plugins to babel but I guess if you do, you kind of rely on it. And uh, I'm assuming that this is useful because the Babel relies on AST syntax, right? So that you, you have the abstract syntax tree and again, matching it manually would be quite counterproductive. Let's put it this way. So having snapshots, we can just say, hey, make sure the abstract syntax tree is correct. Um, it's pretty great. So, and obviously there's like a few more examples. So if you're interested, do have it, it seems to be very well thought through. And um, there is yeah, some other snapshot libraries highlighted aside from just, you know, the general, um, hey, snapshots. Yeah. 
Right, continuing, we got the, um, so I'm going to talk a bit more about the Chrome 66 and uh, V8 version 6.6 .6 in the releases section, but I thought I would highlight this specific thing. So um, Chrome 66 and the new JS, uh, V8 JS version will compile JavaScript in the background. So there's this image that basically explains everything. So in, the, in uh, prior to this version, the way it worked is basically main thread would like parse it and then the there will be like AST internationalization, compilation, bytecode, and then only then execution, right? And then there might be some other stuff uh, that could happen, but it would, it would only happen during the parsing. So the parsing was off thread. Right now they move the compilation off thread as well. So all of that happens, well, quite much faster, which like, you know, I still, I'm still to this day amazed every time the, uh, v8 guys or uh, like firefox guys come out and just say hey we made javascript like five times faster again by doing this and that it's like how why why is it, why is it still possible to make it faster it's like a 20 percent um time reduction reduction is insane this is just just think about it 20 percent that is a lot okay continuing um this is not strictly javascript related it's called uh, the article is called cd is wasting your time so if you're using the command line shell a lot, you are probably using CD a lot, right? And uh, you might not know about a really cool project that is called AutoJump. I believe they talk about AutoJump in here as well. Uh, yeah, so the idea is that it will uh, remember the folders that you go through, right? And then you can just type J and then the folder partial folder name and hit tab and it will suggest you a list of things that are the most relevant to the typed keyword. So this, this, um, I'm unfortunately not on my MacBook where I have it set up right now, but it does saves you CDing into, especially, you know, the folders that are not in the current year and, and maybe not even in the current subfolders or whatever. It does save you a lot of time. So uh, it takes quite, you know, like few minutes to set it up essentially, but jumping from one folder to another makes it so much easier to navigate your system. So I like if, again, if you're using the command line tools uh, a lot, and if you are the CLI guy and shell guy, highly recommend looking at this article, it goes to explain, you know, how to install it, how to configure it, some basic stuff here and there. Um, it is an amazing tool and yeah, once again, not strictly JavaScript related, but I thought, you know, there might be people who never heard about that. So, hey, worth highlighting, definitely worth highlighting. Right, next big thing we have is a bunch of articles on React. So um, we're gonna talk about that again more during the releases section, but uh, we have an article called Update on the Sync Rendering, which is uh, related to React 16.3 release right and uh, it goes to talk about the all the breaking things all the legacy lifecycle methods that has been deprecated and how to move it how to move from them to the new ones and there is even a ton of examples which is again so once you will be upgrading to the new version of react you have a very clear path of how to do that and this article essentially helps you in doing that and as you can see there's like a ton of examples which is insane like it's just <laughs> I guess this is this is basically coming from this 50,000 components Facebook guys have an internally, right? So um, we are going to talk a bit more about what changed in React and what kind of new things you can um, get from upgrading to it in the releases section, as I already mentioned. Right, continuing. Um, the I don't like the title of the article, but uh, well, it's called Google publishes a JavaScript style guide. Here are some key lessons. Um, I don't like the, the idea that those are lessons, but I think it's always interesting to sort of look into the style guides of larger companies and their code bases to see how, how they prefer to format code, right? Because I think like the style guide is anyway your very personal thing and uh, there's no right or wrong here, right? So uh, somebody likes it this way, the other person doesn't like semicolons, uh, the other guy uses tabs for indentation and it, it's a, it, like as long as you stick to one Formatting style, I don't really care how is it correct, like, you know, how is it styled exactly. If you provide me with like editor config, prettier config and the ESLint to make sure that I abide by it, then personally don't really care, don't really think there are lessons to be learned here, but it is interesting nonetheless. So this is a pretty in-depth uh, look at what the style, what the style guide uh, from the Google guys is. So like for example, they use spaces, 
they use semicolons. I also prefer using semicolons because there are edge cases that would screw up your stuff. And um, although Prettier makes them way more obvious than uh, it could have been before, you still can mess up even with Prettier because it's not perfect, right? So there still might be bugs that might screw you up. So, and uh, the interestingly enough, they are don't use, for example, ES6 modules yet, which is a bit weird. I mean, I, you know, like with modern uh, workflows with Babel and Webpack and all that stuff, you can use ES6 or whatever, ES2015 and later quite easily. So I'm not sure why not use them. I usually stick to the uh, um, just simple, um, Man, I forget common GS modules, uh, whenever I don't want to set up like if I don't need Babel for any features, you know, so basically, if it, if I would set them up only for modules, then I'll be like, whatever, I'll just use common uh, GS, because you know, I don't really need that overhead. But honestly, if I set up Babel, and if I have pre compilation anyway, why not use modules as well? They are, um, in my opinion, quite much nicer than common GS actually, but yeah. So yeah, there's other insights like horizontal alignment, don't use var, RO functions are preferred. And uh, it actually looks pretty close to Airbnb style, for example, which I use as my base style. Um, they, for whatever reason, do not really use um, template literals, which allow you multi-line strings, right? So they, they split the strings using the uh, pluses, which I mean, it might look okay, but I don't know, it's, it's a bit weird, I guess. Yeah. Um, for office prefer yeah, whatever. So just have a look at it. If you are interested, there are some interesting things going on here and there. Um, but again, I wouldn't call it lessons. So just, you know, just an interesting thing to look at. Right, continuing, uh, this is actually an add on from uh, Mozilla from Firefox guys, um, you probably at this point heard about Facebook fiasco and the data stealing and all that kind of stuff, right? So um, I kind of I, I was curious as well, you know, how much data does Facebook have about me because I am using uh, you block and you metrics to block just about everything that I can. So literally nobody on internet cannot track me if I don't want that. So I was like, Okay, let me just download the whole data dump and see if uh, if, if it's as bad as I saw it. And I was kind of disappointed to see that uh, the only data that was there was exactly what I expected to be there. But if you are not as, as crazy as me and you do not block everything, including JavaScript, third party JavaScript, third party cookies, then you might have more data. Well, um, Mozilla guys have a solution for you. So if you did know, let me f uh, run a Firefox, uh, Firefox have a very neat feature. So when, when you start the Firefox, you have this um, containers, um, idea of containers, right? The idea is that you have a bunch of profiles and uh, no, thank you, LastPass. And all of those profiles have isolated uh, settings, isolated cookies, isolated local storage, isolated data. So all of that stuff is um, gonna run within that specific container. That's maybe not a bad idea. Let's just go to the Reddit, for example, right? And you can say, okay, th this is my uh, personal container, right? So I'm gonna run uh, Reddit always in this personal container, which means that whenever I use something else in a different container, it won't have access to my Reddit data, right? This is it's just an example. So for example, you can do the same for your banking app. So whenever I use my bank, I will only do this in banking container. So whenever I open the shady shops in a other container, they won't know anything about my bank. And I think this is an amazing idea actually, it works really well. And uh, what they did is they they released this specific extension that creates Facebook container and throws in anything that is related to Facebook inside of that container, which is an amazing idea. So basically, you could still use Facebook, you could still use all of its features. But the Facebook won't know anything about you because it will be just living in its own tiny container within Firefox. And I like this is one of those features that really pushes me towards Firefox, because I absolutely love the idea of it. But um, yeah, it's like, you know, there are some things that missing from Firefox that stop me from switching to it, essentially. Uh, hey, Slayer Darth, how's it going? Welcome to the stream. Uh, let us um, continue, I guess. So we got uh, next article is called Preact Meets CMS, building lightweight portable widget components. And uh, it is a pretty extensive description of some ideas and uh, library that the author built. 
to um, sort of inline, to build small reusable components like fidgets and use them within one large CMS. So if this is your uh, kind of the problem you're facing right now, then this might be very interesting. There's a strictly defined problem. There's strictly defined advantages of the components. And there is a pretty good uh, outline of basically the thought process of, you know, how do you go from here to there? And the result is this uh, small library called Preact Habitat. So this, in this case, the whole article goes on about Preact, but uh, you know, once again, Preact and React are not too far away from each other. So if you are familiar with React, you should be immediately um, familiar with what the uh, author does here with this Preact Habitat thing. I found it interesting that basically when you build a component, the way that you include it in the CMS is using a script tag and just, you know, pointing it to the uh, uh, hello widget. Um, yeah, there are many leaps, yes, but they are really cool. And in 90% of cases, you don't really care about them. It's like, you know, if you, if you are not encountering that problem, then you can just forget about this library after reading this article and being like, oh, that's really cool. So I don't think that's a major issue, you know? and once you encounter this problem, you will be like, oh, I remember there was a lib to solve this. So you don't actually have to write it yourself. So in my opinion, that's a good thing that there are so many libraries. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, so there's like a bit more in depth dive uh, and dive into the library itself. Uh, again, just have a look at it. Obviously, open source um, uses shadow, uh, shadow DOM, which is pretty neat. So the components are actually completely isolated, which is also really cool. Uh, but yeah, um, yeah, have a look at it. So next article we have is a practical functional JavaScript. Um, this is, I mean, again, so I, I've been writing JavaScript for like more than five years now, I think, right? And um, functional is basically my my style of a choice, right? So whenever I can, I prefer to do function uh, way uh, things in a functional way. That's why I absolutely love things like pattern matching proposal or pipeline operator proposals and stuff like this. And I think even if you like the object oriented way more, um, you still can benefit a lot from learning the functional approaches in JavaScript, right? So if you are not familiar with them, or maybe even if you are and you want a refresher, then do have a look at this article because it goes through the most common uh, things and most common concepts that uh, can help you quite a lot. Like, you know, higher order functions, carrying, partial application, composition, all that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, there's the piping thing, which is basically the pipeline operator, right? So it explained how to do it right now, how to do it yourself. Um, but we are getting pipeline operator, which is like 10 times nicer than this. So yeah, this is pretty great. Let me have a quick look at the chat. My fear is that too many devs will uh, become far too reliant on libs to the extent that even simple things they use a lib for. Um, I mean, you already rely on too many things, right? You rely heavily on the core library of whatever language you use. And that's not a problem. It's like, um, you sound almost like you want people to implement their own, you know, like tree traversal algorithms and uh, data storage structures. Like you can do that if you want to, but I, I'm almost like 99.9% .9 sure that your implementation is going to be worse than uh, the ones that are out there in the core libraries and the libraries with like years of experience. We are getting to this tracks. <laughs> we are getting to this awesome thing. But uh, so basically, let me just finish this uh, thought. So the idea is that um, it is you can implement everything yourself, but there is no need to though. It's, it's okay to rely on third party libraries because most of the time they will be so long in development, they're gonna do things better than you can do it within a few days. It doesn't mean that you don't know how to program. It just means that you rely on the knowledge, on the collective knowledge of like, you know, a bunch of like incredible people who do open source work instead of trying to reinvent the wheel. Um, I'm not saying that reinventing the wheel is a bad thing. I did that myself more than once and a few times it came out uh, better than some other tools. Not like not gonna brag it or anything about that. Um, but yeah, so I wouldn't be so, you know, afraid of using third party libs because there's a lot of knowledge that goes into them. So it's not just, not just, you know, like, hey, there's a library, so I'm gonna use it because I'm lazy. It's more of a, hey, there's a library, I'm gonna use it because I think they spent so much time on it that they probably have uh, better expertise in this area than me. So this is my angle on it. 
All right, let us continue. So there is um, another amazing article from Mozilla Hacks um, people. Um, I think, yeah, so if, I don't know if you've been reading that. This one's called BS Modules, a cartoon deep dive. So Link Clark has been doing these cartoon deep dives into a very complicated uh, topics of the underlying things uh, in JavaScript like WebAssembly and Node.js and there's like a bunch of them. So this one is basically on how the ES modules work. And uh, if you were curious about the internals, there is a very neat comic like explanation of how all of this stuff functions, how the module instances, how the loading is done and all that kind of stuff. So um, it's, it, you know, it's, it's pretty cool that it is uh, presented in such a sort of uh, fun form, let's put it this way. So it's a bit more, um, I guess it's a bit easier to understand than your typical spec that you would read on those modules, right? Because specs are always like written in a very formal language and can be hard to figure out what the hell's going on. And here, most of the things you can actually figure out just by looking at the images. Obviously there are descriptions that explain it in more depth, but uh, hey. Okay, let me have a quick look in the chat. It's mostly for the front-end libs. Uh, front-end devs who uh, import bloated jQuery libs for a simple func. Oh yeah, I mean, I think this comes from just the lack of uh, knowledge about the core of the language, right? So I've seen people rely on absolutely stupid things from jQuery that um, was already in the JavaScript core and they just didn't know about it and they don't even know where to look for it. So they absolutely agree on that problem. But I think that just, you know, if people are not too lazy and if, if you basically, if you are a senior developer, you have to educate your juniors, you have to just tell them, hey, there's the, there's an amazing MDN docs and just go and read that and you're most likely gonna find a solution there without even importing anything. Um, and also, yeah, the tracking, I think tracking the resulting application size helps a lot. So like having some metrics when you build your app and, and uh, maybe when you push it to the remotes to show, you know, like, hey, your commits will increase the app size by 55 kilobytes and there's like 20% of all our uh, volume of the app. So you might rethink how you did that. That usually helps. All right, uh, next thing is an article called Optimizing React Virtual DOM Explained. Um, it is a pretty in-depth uh, write through on how the React Virtual DOM works, how it's implemented, what is JSX. So if you are interested in this kind of stuff, and as you can see, the article is pretty damn long. So it goes very, very in depth on all of that stuff. So if, if you ever was interested in how the React, uh, like underlying React things, actually work, this is a really, really solid article to just look through it and, you know, look at the uh, even like debugging and uh, performance tracing, all that kind of stuff. So this really, really cool one and highly recommended uh, for everyone who works with React and still doesn't know uh, how the virtual DOM works. Not that it's required, I mean, it can still work without knowing it, but knowing the underlying uh, logic will actually help you optimize it. This is why it's talking about optimization, right? All right, uh, next thing we have is a um, pretty in-depth article on uh, using uh, like writing progressive web apps with RDC. So uh, this is uh, essentially a use case uh, article. I wanted to say paper, I've been doing too much research lately. Um, so I wanna, like this is a use case article that describes the creation of a progressive web app for a peer in, uh, if you don't know, a sort of like, um, Skype, I guess, but in web using WebRTC in pretty nice platform actually. And uh, again, it's a pretty long article, but it has like code examples and everything. So if you are interested in progressive web apps and want to have uh, one like guide that that one use case, I guess, uh, walk through from the very beginning to the very end, this is a pretty good one to read about. And very like there are some interesting points here and there. Uh, I found this chart to be uh, amazing actually. So if you are using mobile apps, then Twitter on iOS is 240 megabytes. Like what, what the hell do they put there? Twitter on Android is 24 megabytes, which is okay because you know, you drag in a lot of frameworks. But if you use the Twitter progressive web app is just 600 kilobytes. Well, obviously you have to count the browser, I guess, but hey, um, it's 600 kilobytes seriously like, compared to 200 megabytes on iOS. This is insane. I really love where the progressive web apps are going. And yes, I am impressed by the speed of progress, like the good progressive web apps as well. And I'm really like, really hoping we could, hell, replace all the mobile apps with progressive web apps because um, 
hair just work better. They went like for reals, even not just size. I think the progressive app app for Twitter is actually snappier than the mobile apps, which is absolutely insane from my perspective. But yeah, so it's a pretty nice uh, use case, as I said, uh, like walkthrough. Yeah, so do have a look at it if you are into that. All right. The next article is getting started with the WebMeeti API. Um, until reading this, I did not know that WebMeeti API was a thing, but apparently it is a thing. And you, you actually, like Web has so many crazy APIs that I could, like, I, like you really, I, it's so hard to track that sometimes. But uh, basically, yes, you can now have a, like MIDI access from the browser, which is again, great because we can have a MIDI uh, progressive web apps which is like, hell, I'll take that, you know, me making music right in the browser. Well, pff, why not? So yeah, it goes uh, like through basic access through invocation uh, and connecting to the I think it's only uh, so yeah, you can also receive the MIDI messages and send them. So basically, it's full flesh, you can like uh, tap into the reading your MIDI keyboard or something like this, right? Unfortunately, it's only supported in the Chrome essentially right now, um, because Opera and Android Web are also based on Chrome. So it's like, you know, the V8 and uh, Blink, I guess, uh, we're gonna be talking here. But uh, hopefully the other people will uh, pick it up as well. So it also seems to be quite new because if I see correctly, the Chrome 60, 61, I guess, did not support it yet. So it's a pretty new standard, which I guess explains why I didn't know about it. Um, there seems to be already like polyfills available if you want to, I guess they just use the web audio API to synthesize everything. And uh, yeah, so there's even a small app they built um, to try out and play with. So if you are interested in music, if you want to play a bit with web MIDI, then do have a look at this article. Right, continuing, I think this is the last article we have in the article section. It's called Developing a Bitcoin yeah. Let me try that again. Developing a Bitcoin cryptocurrency application with Node.js and no SQL. So uh, this like the, the Node.js and NoSQL part is actually quite boring, I would say, because they just use Express.js if I remember correctly. Uh, but um, there's been a lot of people. So that's, this is article, let me just mention it really quickly. The, this article is from Couchbase. So the database in this case is Couchbase. It's a pretty decent database. I've used in a couple of projects and works relatively nice for most of the things that it does. I did not have any problems with it, but didn't really do any major projects with it neither. So, you know, would not comment on that. But the interesting part of this tutorial is actually not the Express or Couchbase bit because there's plenty of those tutorials. The interesting bit is the Bitcore lib and Bitcore mnemonic libraries that they use. And there's a whole separate section over here explaining uh, where the hell is it? I think this is, yeah, this is the, um, the for some reason it didn't, is not named, but basically there's a whole, um, I guess 50% of the article talks about using the Bitcoin technology within your project, which is quite interesting, right? So the express and, and all that stuff is boring. I know that a lot of you guys have been asking me about, you know, how to build something with cryptocurrency, how to build an app that uses Bitcoin. There you go. That's a pretty good write up. And uh, it goes quite in depth on how to use all of that. So it is not Ethereum. So if you're interested in that, you will have to find a different article, but uh, the dust talks about Bitcoin uh, quite in depth. So yeah. Right, uh, now we are coming to the releases section. And the first one of this week is the Next.js 5.1. As you might know, this is my favorite framework to build um, web apps right now. And every time they do a release, they just claim crazy numbers that are absolutely true. So they, this new release um, makes resolving pages 102 times faster than before, which is, <laughs> hundred times faster page resolution. This is just crazy. It's like every time. And there's also, yeah, like, yeah, as you can see here, this page resolution and uh, there's like the real numbers. So you can literally see this like hundred times faster, which is nice, I guess, because the old versions used to be like kind of slow ish uh, from time to time, but you know, seems to be improving in here. There's now um, environment configs uh, that you can do in uh, Next.js config, for example, obviously with examples as usual, improved error handling, um, phases and config functions within your next plugins if you want to, 
improved uh, source map generation again if you want to and uh what else is there Plug new plugins and improvements so i guess you know this is oh they are the added bundle analyzer as a plugin that's really cool so um yeah webpack bundle analyzer is a pretty neat tool to you know, sort of give you the webpack uh statistics uh about your bundle let me just quickly open that I think they should have yeah there you go so you can basically see the whole bundle and the size of it and this is for example very useful for when you want to uh, make people aware of the overhead they're adding with including other things you know so adding that as a plugin to next.js would mean that you can easily see the results right away um yeah i think that's basically all the highlights so really excited to see how they will develop from here I uh, should try, should I probably update my projects to it because it will make them significantly faster. So yeah, really, really cool release. Right, the next one, I already mentioned it briefly. The V8 is now version 6.6. .6, so this is the latest stable release. It is not uh, in Chrome yet. As you might know, the Chrome is sort of lagging slightly behind the V8 releases themselves and as well. This is, I think this is actually the uh, V8 that is targeted for Node 10. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, if nothing changed basically over the time, so this is probably what we're gonna see in the node uh, version 10 is gonna be released in the next months. So aside from that compilation thing, there are some uh, JavaScript features. Uh, so we got the function prototype to string uh, that returns exact slice of source text, um, including the white spaces and comments. Before that was not the case if you were not aware of that. So that had, there was some issues with that basically. And uh, now it's actually true. Yeah. Let me try that again. Now it's truthful to the source. Um, there is now trim functions for the strings that are a part of ES 2017, I think, or 18. Um, yeah, so the values method is now in uh, and works for the uh, maps and sets, which is always great. Um, there is code caching, like better, or I, I'm not sure if it's better code caching uh, or it is just some changed code caching, but basically, mm, oh yeah, there you go. Before V8, we cached the generated code immediately. And I guess now it sort of have a difference. So there's the cold, warm and hot caching policies. So it's gonna be way more efficient. So a background compilation that we already talked about, Removal of um, AST numbering, which I guess was the turbofan and ignition uh, thing. We got a synchronous perform like the performance again. The performance improvements the V8 team brings and every release is just about as insane as what you see in next year's. They might not claim hundreds of you know hundred times improvements, but when you think that this is a whole engine that runs JavaScript and they manage to squeeze like. 10 to 20% of improvement on every freaking release is just crazy. Again, there's like, you know, performance, 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 and memory profiling. And yeah, there's no more JIP now. So that's like a thing that's gonna be coming to the notes. Years get confusing. Uh, what do you mean by years get confusing? Oh, you mean the um, ES format, ES standards? Yeah, it's like, I mean, they have to name it as years, but like hell if I can remember all that was released in a specific year without looking it up. It's like, I, I get the idea of naming it by years because they wanna have the fast cycle of releases, right? For the spec, but um, trying to remember what the hell was in the current year or the next year or the previous year is really hard. So you have to actually Google for it, but it's absolutely fine, you know. All right, uh, continuing the next large release is a TypeScript 2.a. So it's, uh, we talked about it in a previous um, podcast, I think. So the major highlight of this is the conditional types. This is what I already highlighted last time. Now it is live. And uh, in addition to that, we have the, um, okay, this is all conditional. There's some built-in helpers. I think we already talked about that as well. Um, just, yeah, so basically whatever I highlighted the last time is now in a um, official version and they also added like organized imports and some other small auto fixes, which is really cool. And all of that is added to the VS code automatically, which is even better, which is, you know, like awesome so that you don't have to manually fix all those issues with uh, whatever the um, 
TypeScript complains about it, you can just say, hey, fix it for me. Which, you know, it's always awesome to see how much thought they put into those features. Uh, obviously, there are some breaking changes, but it doesn't seem to be too many of them. And uh, yeah, this, if you're interested in more development, there is TypeScript Roadmap, which is very detailed and usually has a lot of stuff on it. So that's the thing. All right. Next thing we got is the Node.js releases. So we got uh, v9.10 and actually .1 released almost immediately after it to fix some uh, problems with it. We got the LTS updates for both for 8 and 6. And uh, I think the major thing, major highlight of all those releases was the openness set upgrade that fixed some vulnerabilities as well in addition. Uh, so yeah, it's basically a good idea to update your stuff, especially if you're running on LTS. All right, continuing, we got the, um, this is sort of article slash release, and um, it is about the ESM. So you've probably heard about it or maybe not. It was called STD ESM before, but now it's just ESM. And right now it is version, uh, well, it's actually three. Um, there was like, it's ready for, so the article says it's ready for productions. And I was expecting it to be version 1.0, but apparently it's version 3.0. So whatever. Um, STDSM has been in development for ages, but now it's actually, they announced it as a like stable release that is now ready for production. And if you, ha if you haven't used it, it's an amazing tool. And you know, if you don't want to pull the whole Babel, for example, for using the ES6 modules, then just using this um, ESM module will allow you to do that. And uh, it actually also wraps the default modules in ES modules, so you can actually use them with imports as well. Basically, yes, if you wanna use ES6 modules in a Node.js today without bringing in Babel, this is a way to do that. It has zero configuration, it works, it, it, it has very, very tiny overhead. It supports MJS, it supports JavaScript, like just .js, so it's configurable and uh, it just just works. Basically, it's, it's, you know, one of the cool things is that um, uh, author of the module, uh, Jay Dalton, actually plugged it into the Node.js core. It took him about 30 minutes how to do that. And there's a video right here in his tweet that shows off that the imports just work which, you know, I, man, I would love to see that just being adopted as a solution for the whole MJS thing, because there's been so much pain with that stuff, so much discussion and so much anger at everything. It's like, yeah. But yeah, basically, if you are looking for a thing uh, for, you know, using ESM modules, be it within tests or just your code, then this is this is the solution and it's it's great. I've used it more than once and it works really, really well. Right, continuing, we got to the probably biggest thing, biggest release of the week, uh, React 16.3.0 that uh, adds async rendering, that adds new lifecycle methods that are related to this async rendering, and new context API. So this is, um, yeah, this is the basically first official stable context API because React used to have context API a long time ago, but it was sort of inside of the React itself and was not recommended to use because it could change at any time and so on and so forth, it was not documented. But now they have actual official context API. So what it allows you to do is, I mean, maybe increase this a bit, create a context, right? So for example, in this case, you have a theme context, right? And uh, what you do is you wrap your children with this provider, which has the value, whatever you set. So in this case, we have a theme is light, right? And then in children that will have to access this context, you wrap them into consumer and then the uh, you will use the function which will get the props as the, uh, the value from this context, right? So this is how it looks. This allow, I, if, if, as far as I understand, this, this child that access the context can be anywhere within those children. So it doesn't necessarily have to be the direct descendant of this provider, which is the good thing basically. Um, there's also the create ref API, which we talked about last time. Basically, you can pass in the, or no, the create ref we haven't talked, we talked about the ref forwarding. So yeah, it's a new way to create references now. So instead of just saying like this, you know, R equals this input ref R whatever, you can actually create ref and then just assign it like this. 
which is a nicer way, I would say, right? And uh, I think you would also, oh, the callbacks are still supported, I guess, but maybe they will be deprecated at some point. And um, okay, so you don't need to replace them. Uh, they are slightly more flexible, okay. I guess they will remain. All right, then you don't have to replace it, but uh, you know, that actually looks much cleaner from my perspective. So that's probably my preferred way of doing, uh, will be my preferred way of doing things. Right, we got the forward ref API that allows you to actually forward the reference from uh, components. So when you put your ref on the component, you would actually get the reference of something inside that component. So like a button or div or whatever, right? That's gonna be forwarded to the parent when you ask it. Uh, which is can be useful in more than one case as we discussed last time. So it's a pretty cool to see. And yes, related the change related to the async rendering modes, the lifecycle changes. So the component will mount, will receive props and will update methods are getting deprecated. They are still here for the version 16, but they will be prefixed with unsafe and they will be removed um, in version 17 once it's released, whenever it comes. I, I'm not sure actually when, when the date will be, but basically it's better to fix them. So there's even provided a script that will rename it, uh, auto rename them to unsafe if you want to. But uh, basically what you want to really do is you want to use new methods that are called get derived state from props and get snapshot before update to replace uh, those three, right? So um, again, that article that I showed before goes into a lot of in-depth details on how to do that, how to fix those, how to use the new methods. And I think this is the same link. Yeah, exactly. This is the link. And you know, there's, I think there's enough examples for you to fix your code with, <laughs> without, um, relying on unsafe prefixes. Obviously, this is a better mode. They now have this strict mode component inside of the React core. So it's similar to fragments. And um, the idea is that basically, you have, a, you can run React in a strict mode, and whatever is within this component, if you use any unsafe methods, or have uh, legacy APIs or whatever, the unsafe mode will complain about it and throw errors. Uh, sorry, strict mode. Uh, so basically, you have a way to check your app for anything that might be breaking it in the future, right, which is quite neat. All right, that's it for the react bit. The next release we have today is a parcel version 170 uh, has a, like if you if you haven't heard about parcel it's essentially a more lightweight, more simpler, straightforward webpack uh, with uh, quite a lot of really cool features. Um, New release as I said, so there's now zero config view support, which is great for all you view people there. Um, there is now hashed bundle names for long term caching if that's again, this, you know, always good to see speed ups. There is uh, faster resolving for the aliases and path. Um, again, always great. So if you use the tilde, which I think points to the root of the project. Um, automatically installing missing dependencies in the code if they are in your package or yarn file, which is also great, I guess. I mean, I, I don't, you know, I don't think there's a major problem. But I guess when you collaborate on a project and give it to some testers or something, you don't always want to bug them with like, hey, did you run npm install? It now has GLSL support, which is kind of insane if you think about it. But yes, you can now package all your webgl uh, GLSL codes using parcel, which is like great. Uh, they added Pug and Jade support, which is the template languages, right? So again, no plugins right in the box. Um, HMR error overlays and a ton of bug fixes and improvements. So if you are looking for lightweight webpack replacement, I mean, I'm not sure if I can call it lightweight after this, because they've been adding so many features over all these releases which is kind of great. I mean, so it's becoming an amazing tool and it already has 20,000 stars. Oh my God. So yes, do have a look at it. I think it's a really great tool and uh, literally needs zero setup and you can just, you know, point it to your input file and get an output, including uh, the debug server, which will just work. And it's much faster than that pack. So yeah. Uh, next thing we got released is a new NPM next version. Again, for release, they finally started post fixing it after the last um, story with a pre release that broke everything. Uh, with, I mean, you never should run your stuff with sudo, but hey. So we got 590 next point zero. Um, 
Yeah, it is definitely great that we have so many leaps with the option to choose. Absolutely. That is, I mean, this is probably my favorite point about JavaScript's ecosystem is the just how many awesome libs we have. And, you know, people complain about the fact that, oh, there's too many, but I, I don't think there's such a thing as too many libs if they are good. So I would take more libs, more good libs than, you know, one bad lib in any other language, basically. <laughs> That's a terrible com comparison, but I'll go with it. All right, um, so the, the major uh, highlights of this uh, release for NPM is the package view and pack and publish previews that allow you to just have a look at what the hell you're going to publish and uh, pack instead of just, you know, actually relying on NPM pack to just see the zip uh, file or whatever. And there's a merge conflict resolution. Uh, I think it was already introduced in a previous one, but now there's some improvements to it. And obviously like dependency updates and miscellaneous stuff, which is boring. So we're going to skip that. Right. Next thing is um, RxJS 6.0 RC0. So um, you might know that RxJS is one of my favorite libraries for working with like streams and asynchronous data uh, that is essentially not, you know, fire once and forget like promises. So this I've been using RxJS for most of my time working with JavaScript. And I think it's an amazing thing. And they've been doing quite a lot of things like every major release they do for the library is just incredible. And as you can see here, the changes in six is well, yeah, that's there's quite a lot of them. And uh, yeah, so really cool to see RC here. Um, again, those guys usually do very um, like incredible job on uh, keeping you up to date on how to, you know, migrate from five to six and so on and so forth. So really looking forward to the full release and seeing what exactly has changed. I think mostly it's related to performance improvements again and uh, things like WebSocket and other compatibility things that makes it simpler. Uh, yes, observers. So there is uh, wait, so observer proposal. I'm not sure about soon, but there is an observer uh, observable proposal. So I think I don't know which stage it is um, currently at. But it is Yeah, it is a thing. It is a proposal that has been in work for quite some time. Um, I don't know what kind of what is what stage is it at? It doesn't say anything here. Uh, but it basically they, they they've written the whole proposal off of RxJS, which is absolutely amazing. I mean, having that in the engine would mean we will have like 10 times the performance once the V8 guys and Firefox guys will get their hands on it, you know. Okay, this that doesn't seem to be saying anything about the stage, but it's been in development for quite some time. And uh, obviously getting that in the core would be freaking amazing. Um, it's going to simplify the usage of a MobX a lot or at least rep uh, dependency. Okay. Um, I think yeah, I think it will simplify a lot things. Uh, you know, it's like, I think it will have more or less the same stage one at the top. Am I just blind? um observable blah 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 um probably just blind and not seeing oh okay <laughs> i am blind thank you for pointing that out so it's stage one uh as of january 2017 i guess so there's obviously i guess there are some blockers since it's been stage one so long but yeah i think um at least my bet is that this observe getting like observables and observers into the core would have more or less the same impact as the ES6 proxies. So it's going to be kind of game changing. And uh, I can imagine a lot of people are going to complain about it because it's not an easy topic to understand, but having it in core and again, optimized by the engine teams would be huge. And you could, you like, you will be able to do some crazy things with it. Not that you cannot really make it with um, RxJS today, but hey, it's always better to have that stuff in the core because it kind of makes sense as a as a core um, abstraction, right? All right, continuing, we got the X3O, though this is a tool that I actually haven't used myself, but I heard a lot of really good things about. It's, a, it's an accessibility testing tool that does essentially automated accessibility testing and provides you with the reports that uh, help you figure out what you need to do to uh, sort of make your products um, ally compliant, right? So 
if you are in this area do have a look at this it's already version 3.0 which i assume means it has a lot of um new and awesome features seems to be having like shadow dom support and all that kind of stuff um so yeah uh, do have a look if this is your area core features also uh do core features also get removed uh what do you mean where all right, meanwhile, I'm gonna highlight the Carbon 3.0 release, which uh, is, it's a web-based tool for uh, fancily formatting your code. So you can actually, I uh, know that's not what I want. You can uh, pick a background, you can pick uh, theme, you can pick language formatting. And um, it, it's kind of similar to, what was the name of it? I think it was like a Codestagram or whatever it was. Uh, no, JS never removes car features. So the TC39 main rule is do not break the web and removing the JavaScript features from the language would mean that the, it will break the web, like break the old websites, right? And they cannot do that. So this is like literally the only rule that they have uh, when uh, looking, like the, the main rule they have when, when they uh, consider when, when changing the standard, right? So that's why the the whole like smoosh thing happened right um we talked about that last time there you go so the flat flat map smoosh problem is there because they cannot remove things they cannot add things that will break things right so this is this is the whole problem and um yeah and this discussion is it still open no they, no no they closed it okay <laughs> all right so yes, no, absolutely the features will not be removed. Okay, uh, so yeah, Carbon 3.0, if you don't wanna install anything or if you just want a web-based version with a fancy looking UI to make screenshots, this is a good one. Do have a look at it and you can even auto tweet it and get a nice image here. Pretty nice tool. Um, the next thing we have is, uh, so we, we, we're coming to the uh, libraries part now. Um, first library we have, or libraries and tools, I guess, because this is not exactly a library. This is a tool, it's called WebDash, and it's sort of a customizable dashboard to manage your project, which shows you dependencies, your pay PVA manifest, NPM scripts, performance budget, and I think it's extensible by plugins. So you can actually, yeah, so the, you know, you have things like uh, updating uh, stuff, running NPM scripts, seeing the PVA manifest with preview of your icon, preview of the status bar, splash bar, whatever you configure there. And um, all of that stuff, I think is built on uh, Electron JS. if I am not mistaken, let me quickly check that. It is, oh, it is actually not, I guess it's a web-based thing, right? So what does it use as bricks? To, yeah, it's okay, so it's a web-based thing, so you just run it and you will probably get it in your browser. All right, uh, but yeah, so basically it's a pretty neat thing to sort of manage your project. And I guess as it will get more plugins, it might be pretty nice to, you know, quickly get an overview of what the hell is going on. Okay, so it's uses serve, yeah, so you get the uh, browser window. All right, next thing we have is a natural language uh, processing library called JS Lingua. It has a bunch of modules uh, about information language uh, transliteration and morphology. And uh, there's like some bunch of use cases. So if you are into the, um, I think it blocked, no, it doesn't not block something. Um, you, I don't really have anything here. Can you get examples please somewhere? Doesn't, for whatever reason, doesn't load any examples. I'm not sure why, uh, maybe something is a bit broken, but basically, yeah, it, it has a lot of uh, nature language features uh, and tools that are working for quite a lot of languages. So if you are in this field, then, and you know, you wanna do that kind of stuff in the browser, then do have a look at it as quite a lot of uh, pretty cool features. Right, next tool is React Notification System. There is a nice demo over here. Um, it basically allows you to, why is my internet so slow? Come on. I hope the stream does not really suffer from my internet being wonky today because it's it's been, um, I don't know what's wrong with it, but come on, there we go. There is definitely some, some small issues with my connection. I guess I should also do that. All right, so yeah, the idea is very simple. You can summon the notifications that uh, some of them will basically disappear after a few seconds. Some of them will stay there permanently unless you obviously close them yourself. 
You also can have like the buttons that you can actually press on them that will do something. And it, you know, it's a very nice uh, small library that is uh, doesn't really have any external dependencies that are too large. So as you can see here in the package JSON, the only dependencies are actually like some utilities like create react class object design and prop types, which basically are polyfills for some stuff and simplifying the, the utilities. So you don't have to drag in anything. Looks quite nice works quite nice. So if you are looking for a notification system, that might be uh, what you were looking for. Continuing, we got this C capture JS. So this is not a new library, but uh, I thought it was really cool because I haven't seen it before. Uh, and I thought, you know, I would highlight it. So it's a library that can capture canvas based animations uh, with a permanent uh, frame rate with a fixed frame rate. So the idea is that you can uh, actually uh, whenever you have the something on canvas in your web page, and you want to record it and export it as a video preview or whatever, it's actually quite a lot of uh, like, quite a huge pain in the ass to do that, right? So using this library actually allows you to do that just just like this, basically, which which is kind of amazing, to be honest, and you can again, specify the fixed frame rate if you want to. And uh, yeah, it is it is kind of great. And again, you can, you know, export it as a blob, uh, preview it, save it and so on and so forth. The demo doesn't want to load for me, but whatever. So yes, if you are doing any WebGL or canvas based demos, then do have a look for it because it seems to be working pretty damn good. Um, right, next library is React Adopt. Uh, so since we have the new context thing and the prop components are now a favorite thing, render props, render props everywhere, exactly. So since this is the thing and uh, you know, doing like writing code like this is not very nice because you have like, hey, we have a render prop here and then you have a nested render prop here. So what this library suggests is composing those render props, right? So you compose the render props uh, using this adopt function. And then you just say compose is a new component, which will expose both of them. So you use destruction to actually just render that stuff, which uh, actually looks like a very nice pattern. and. If you're having this problem with render props, that seems to be a pretty neat solution. All right, continuing, we got the pose um, library from, um, I guess a sub library from pop motion guys, which already did a pretty impressive uh, motion library. So this is a zero config library that does um, CSS animations, right? It's declarative and works with react and does some pretty damn good looking things. And uh, yeah, so you know, if you're looking for any of those animating things, and um, whatever you can imagine property changing all of that works, like even too well, that just looks amazing to make my, my experience. Uh, and uh, animations are always a pain in ass to do. So it's really cool when there are simple libraries like this that allow you to do it in like literally one click. All right. Um, yeah, this one is actually really big. So TensorFlow guys just released TensorFlow JS. It is WebGL accelerated. We talked about some uh, machine learning uh, WebGL accelerated libraries before, but this now is official TensorFlow one. And um, like you can use it to train modules in in browser, but this is I guess not an interesting part because training in browser is like I it's it's is dubious like if you could if you could uh come up with a way to train um sort of modules in a distributed fashion with all the people visiting your website for example that would be neat but still you know it's kind of like as a like strange research area the cool thing is that you can use it to deploy your machine existing machine learning models right to the browser so what you can do is you can take the uh TensorFlow or Keras or whatever else the TensorFlow compatible uh, library, you can use it offline in your machine in like Python or whatever, C, you know, whatever is your jam to build and to train the model. And then you can use that model in the browser to actually do something, right? So like face recognition, or piano performance. Yeah, so again, this pre-trained models that you can just run in the browser, WebGL powered, which is freaking amazing in my opinion. And again, this is official TensorFlow library. So hey, 
um, kind of curious where all of that will go, and I don't know how. how like, I'm, I'm would be really interested to see how performant it is to train models in the browser because I'm guessing it's not very performant. But uh, I might be mistaken here because this is again uh, not exactly my area of expertise, so I might be just misunderstanding something. But uh, yeah, re anyway, really cool to see this sort of entry and you know more machine learning things um, for the browser and for JavaScript world specifically. Right, next thing is uh, task easy. Um, uh, would that work with Node? That's a very good question. So the thing is that there is no WebGL in Node.js, right? But I think there is Tensor. So the thing is that basically um, TensorFlow is a C library, right? So you have the, you can just wrap it uh, in Node.js bindings and then use it from Node, like basically use it as a C library in Node API. C core library, Swig, Node bindings, Python API, end users. That is a very complicated roadmap. So yeah, I mean, as you can see, there's basically bindings to the C library there. And I believe there was this, uh, what was the, the project from the guy who built Node.js? Um, I talked about it in some of the podcast. Why is my internet so bad today? Wait a second, Node.js, um, deep learning. So there was this project that I talked about. Uh, what was the name of it? Hell if I remember. Um, Node.js, JavaScript, I guess, uh, JavaScript, deep learning from Node.js creator. So there was this platform um, from the guy who built Node.js or Propel, right, there we go. So I think this one, oh, come on, what is wrong with my internet today? Uh, GitHub, there we go. Okay, so I think this one is, so you have this Propel packages for specific platforms. And I think they are actually using TensorFlow and Kara or Keras or something, basically something compatible under the hood. That's why they have the specific packages for specific platforms and specific uh, systems, right? So I believe, I guess a good question, hell if I remember what exactly they used. Um, there was somewhere, was written somewhere. Uh, yeah, okay, I mean, okay, so Propel is exactly TensorFlow, uh, with, oh, without TensorFlow bindings, okay, damn it. <laughs> um, but yeah, but so as I said, you can use TensorFlow in Node.js if you want to, because in the end it's just a C library that you can you know bind to Node.js and just use Node API to access it. But I, I'm guessing there might be better approaches. So again, Propel would be an interesting one because uh, essentially the Node.js author set out to make machine learning easier for everyone, which Again, I'm not sure if the Propel is the right way to do that because you anyway have to understand all this, the gradients and all the functions that you use essentially. So yeah, we'll, we'll see how that goes. It's like, it's, it's interesting development anyway. Right, let's talk about Task Easy. It's um, again, library, I don't know how new it is actually, but I haven't seen it before. So I thought, okay, I highlight it. It's a simple, customizable, lightweight uh, priority queue for promises. So if you ever need to create a, a priority queue, uh, with uh, something that uses promises, then this is what you want. And it seems to be working pretty simple. So there's like three parameters, essentially, you can set priorities, and the tasks within the queue will be prioritized, uh, depending on how you define that, you can have your custom priority functions, like it's described in here, so on and so forth, uh, specify the task limit, and so on and so forth. So it's, you know, if you are looking for something like this within your app, um, it's it seems like a nice solution. So it's very small, very simple, but seems to be doing the job. All right, next thing is Simpact. This is a CPU and MEM profiler, like profiler in, in brackets or in quotes, I guess, uh, for the JS code, because it's, it's not exactly profiler, but it does output quite nice information. Uh, so the idea is that you can uh, wrap your code into this function and um, specify the sampling rate. And once you execute it, you will actually see the very nice uh, sort of statistics that, you know, like CPU usage, RAM usage over the time change for all of that stuff. So it might be quite nice for basically figuring out what the problems are with your code. Although I guess, you know, proper profiling will do the better job, but this is 
this just gives you a very nice outlook on all of that and uh, in a pretty straightforward way basically all right, uh, next thing is a hotkeys.js, uh, which is a key binding library, which you know, you can see me pressing things and it actually highlights it. Um, it supports key, um, what do you call it? The hotkey, how do you call that man? Uh, combinations, shortcuts, key combinations, right? So you can specify multiple of them doing the same thing, which is uh, kind of great. Um, I typically used mouse trap, I think it was called. Uh, no, that's not what I want. Mousetrap JS. <laughs> it's like wherever you're searching for stuff, uh, you have to add JS for it if you want JavaScript library. Yes, this is the one that I typically use. It's more like it's pretty similar and you know like works uh, in more or less the same way. So I guess I'm not sure if, if they opted in for using the one string. I think the array of strings is a nicer way of doing it. But uh, anyways, you know, it seems to be pretty nicely defined. You have like binds, unbinds, pressed, uh, some additional filter functions, conflicts, and so on and so forth, which is um, always great. All right. Um, we got another NLP library here. It's called compromise. Um, it does some crazy things. So again, this is not my area of expertise. And uh, I am very far away from natural language processing. But it's always interesting to see stuff like this. And this one works right in the browser. So um, as you can see here, there's, you know, like the part of the speech detection and the sentence disassembly and probably stemming and all of that stuff is also there. And you even have crazy stuff like convert present, uh, uh, convert sentence to the past tense, parse text numbers, change to negative, turn into plural form. Honestly, it's insane that the library can do that. And it's like 200k, which is even more impressive, I guess. Uh, works in browser and Node.js, obviously, and works like you have like dates and everything. It's, it, it's just, it looks really, really amazing. And, you know, if you're looking for something like this, it seems to be a really cool one uh, called Compromise, once again. Um, already more than 7,000 stars, which is great. Um, so yeah, if you are looking for natural language processing, then do have a look at that. Seems to be able to split stuff to sentences and so on and so forth. So the API is pretty extensive. Right, we got fun stuff now. Um, enough with all this boring stuff. Let's do some fun stuff. So there's this parrot.live thing. Let me open the hyper and uh, show exactly what is that. Um, so if you do this, curl parrots uh, dot live. This is, um, okay, I guess um, the Piper is not exactly the best suited for that because it, it's a bit screwed up. There we go, now it doesn't screw up that much. That looks okay-ish. You get a parrot in your um, command line. Dancing parrots, that, that's basically all it does. <laughs> I saw a really cool suggestion on Twitter about that to use that for network debugging. And if you see the parrot stop dancing, then their network is down. So that is one <laughs> really great suggestion on how to use that thing exactly so so yeah um that that's basically all it does so that, that's just nothing more and um, there is a source code here as well so if you're interested in seeing how it works but there's basically parrot frames you can you can you can you can use parrot frames here too works great <laughs> it's just just a silly thing like this all right the next thing is this um tweet uh, of um way to write pull requests, right? So I think think this is the way that everyone should write pull requests from now on. I, I'm not even going to try to read it. But if you want to, you <laughs> I fixy wixy the JSON API foxy waxy. Perfect way to, to explain what exactly your pull request does. I really like that Dan, who is typically a very calm and, you know, very um, polite person close this with a what in the name of fuck. Um, I don't think that's the anime community specifically. That's just like, <laughs> that is not the anime community thing. That is just like, what the, what the, in the name of fuck is really like the, the correct question to ask here. How did this even, this guy is a contributor. That's even the, the, the weirder thing, you know, it's like offended. <laughs> this is just, an, like, I, I don't know. I'm just, I, I don't know if it's like, a joke here or something but they they're both contributors here and is he get he, did he get hacked like i want to know the backstory of this someone make a tv show out of this 
or you know like a youtube episode or something it's just it's just fun okay and the last thing i have here is i don't know if it's fun or sad but uh, someone did like data science uh like a bit of a data science digging on the uh job market and uh, they found out that 61 percent of entry-level jobs which is basically anything that has like junior in front of them required three plus years of experience so um yeah that's you know like if you if you are doing this as a company you have to rethink what junior means because th this is just so bad dan did not remember writing the reply oh i see okay so there's some backstory to that <laughs> Uh, maybe that was not them. Maybe there was someone else. Okay, but uh, that's does not make it less fun because there's just the, the whole description, like the at least the initial description of the uh, pull request is the 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 worst part of it. I guess <laughs> it's so bad. But yeah, okay, that's basically um, I guess all I have for today. So let me just I guess open BXGS weekly here. Um, do you guys have any other things you want to discuss? Any news maybe I've missed? Any things that you've seen uh, during the week that I have not catched or have not mentioned? So uh, because I've been uh, for the past two days in Berlin doing the Entrepreneur First thing, I might have missed quite a lot actually during those days because it's like quite intense. Um, so yeah, if, if I missed anything, if you found anything else that I didn't mention, if you know any other cool things, do throw them into the chat. I will be happy to look at them and talk about them. Um, if not, then, I mean, we can wrap this up here. It's been almost one and a half hour. And um, yeah, I'm honestly still half dead from traveling to Berlin and doing all the crazy stuff. Um, I am planning to do probably another live stream tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> Dragon Ball Super ended. Oh, no. Wait, does Dragon Ball ever end? Is that is that like a thing? I, I do, so I was just about to say that I'm gonna do a live stream probably sometime tomorrow where I'm gonna talk about the EF. Uh, I mean, I'm not, like there is not that much to talk yet about because the uh, first week was like pre-opening week. So we just did like one day of meeting people and doing stupid shit. Um, I can talk about it in a live stream, but uh, yeah, so I'm definitely going to do that. I'm definitely going to talk about it. It's not going to be too long because there's not much to talk about because it's just been one day. But uh, yes, all right. So it doesn't seem like there is any more news to discuss, any more JavaScript stuff, any more interesting, stupid stuff. Um, all right. Um, well, thank you guys for staying with me. Thank you for watching and uh, have an awesome Easter, I guess, if you're celebrating that. Uh, have an awesome weekend if you are not. And I see you during the next live stream. Stay tuned for the announcements for the Entrepreneur First live stream. Or, you know, if you're watching this on YouTube, it's going to be on YouTube as well. So I'm going to create probably a separate playlist for that. As I said, the first one's not going to be too long, but uh, yeah. All right, guys, uh, have a nice weekend and see you around. Bye.